Greetings, music nerds, and welcome to Season 7 of the Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast. I'm your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in East Nashville, Tennessee. I'm so glad you've chosen to join me once again as we take some deep dives with a cast of wonderful musicians, producers, and engineers that I've managed to track down and speak to about making music, records, and just doing what they do in their lives and music. Don't forget there's a link to a playlist on Spotify and Apple Music with links to many of the songs we discuss on today's episode. You'll find links to those playlists in the show notes below or at our website. Meanwhile, the show continues to be largely listener supported. Your help in keeping the show going is always appreciated and you can do it with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription, which is a monthly payment of your choice. And when you sign up for Patreon, you get an ad-free version of the show to listen to, as well as getting entered to win a cunning prize pack from our sponsors at the end of the season. Or if you're tight for dough and you still want to help out, you can subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just by spreading the word, sharing the show, following us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and telling all your pals about it. You can get links to all this stuff at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, a huge thanks to the sponsors this season. Please check them out and let them know I sent you. They are Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resophonic Guitars, and The Henhouse Hang. All right, thanks so much to you for tuning in, and let's get down to it. Howdy, music nerds, and welcome back to the show. This is episode number 147, and my guest today is the incredible vocalist, performer, and songwriter, William Bell, the very first male artist to be signed to Stax Records, if you can believe that. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to be here with you today. As you may well know, I love digging deep into these episodes where we hear firsthand some of the stories of one of the music scenes that I've drawn so much inspiration from. And today we get to hear about the Stax scene in Memphis from one of the OG Stax artists, William Bell. It's very exciting. You know, Memphis is such an interesting town. It's a great place to visit, a great place to make music in, and to this day it has some of the coolest history that you can still take part in, whether that's going to the full gospel tabernacle church on Sunday to see and hear the great Reverend Al Green preach to his congregation, or checking out some of the historical studios like Sun, Stax, or Sam Phillips Place, or chomping on some killer barbecue at Cozy Corner or Payne's. It's just a great town. Great music town, great town in general. You'll notice that I didn't mention Beale Street, which is a really important part of the history of American music, I think, but now it just kind of freaks me out in a Bourbon Street or Broadway in Nashville kind of way. Regardless, the city itself is happening and weirdly overlooked in a, in a way as far as the great music cities of America go. So what I'm going to do uh, each episode now, if relevant, is suggest some of the old show episodes that I have in the back catalog that have a direct or indirect tie into the current one. And there's quite a, you know, a web of characters now on the show. So this week, I'm going to recommend you go back a couple years and first of all, listen to Matt Ross Spang. And he talks about making records at Sam Phillips Studio, where he spent about 10 years working before he started his own incredible new place. That's episode number 109 in season five. And then due to his direct connection to William Bell, make sure you don't miss episode number 138 from last season with John Leventhal. And he produced William Bell's amazing recent album called This Is Where I Live. So go check that out because we talk about that record and that session on that episode as well. Before we get going here, just as a reminder, anyone that is a Patreon member will be automatically entered into the grand prize draw at the end of the season, and the name will be picked randomly from all Patreon subscribers, and uh, you will get a free Union Tube and Transistor pedal. I'm not sure which one yet, but it's going to be cool. Uh, they're sending it to me first, and I'll get my eyes and hands on it and then send it out to the winner. And there will also be some swag from the other show sponsors. So you can sign up for that with a minimal monthly payment to support the show over at the website, makersandshakerspodcast.com. And I would just like to shout out to a couple new donors this week who were generous enough to help support the show with a small contribution. So many thanks to Simon Patchett and Greg Simmons. You guys are awesome. Thank you. So on the show this week is William Bell. He's an incredible singer. He's a classic songwriter from Memphis. And he grew up singing in the church, but quickly moved on to the scene on Beale Street, back when Beale Street was cool, uh, where he worked with his vocal group, which were called the Del Rios. They worked all over town, but mostly in clubs on Beale Street. 
He was first signed to Stax Records in the mid early mid-60s, I guess, uh, primarily as a songwriter, but also as an artist. It was almost like they couldn't quite decide what to do with him. Was he a writer or was he an artist? He, it's a, it's a, he seems to be unique in that way. Um, other Stax artists at the time, of course, were Otis Redding, Carla Thomas, Booker T and the MGs, who were essentially the house band there, uh, Sam and Dave, the staple singers. Come on. So William wrote one of the label's first hits with his song, You Don't Miss Your Water, and that was in 1961. But his tenure at Stax was sort of truncated in the mid-60s when he enlisted in the Army and spent a couple years in the armed forces. When he came back to Memphis and the Stax world, he seemed to struggle a bit to catch up with the current sound of music and to find his place, his own admission as well. But he did catch up, of course, and he wrote some really classic soul tunes like Everybody Loves a Winner, Any Other Way, a whole bunch of great killer tunes, as well as the absolute blues standard that everybody that listens to a blues record knows called Born Under a Bad Sign. And he tailored that song directly for Albert King, including whispering the lyrics in his ear as Albert King sang them for the first time for his record, which is so cool. You'll hear about that. That song was also covered by Cream, of course, Jimi Hendrix, Etta James, and many others. In another crazy twist, William was supposed to be on the plane that crashed and killed Otis Redding. Um, I'm not going to tell you more about that, but uh, he talks about that on this show as well. William's successes continued through the 70s and 80s, writing and recording more hit soul tunes and having songs covered by artists like Eric Clapton, Lou Rawls, Rod Stewart, and crazily, Billy Idol. Yeah. In 2017, William collaborated with the incredible producer and guitarist John Leventhal to make his album This Is Where I Live, which I mentioned earlier, and that brought him to a new audience and won him a Grammy Award, much deserved. And that killer album was followed by the brand new 2023 album called One Step Closer to Home. Make sure you check out those records as well as all of his classics. Go buy them or check out the playlist for the episode, which um, you will find uh, in the show notes of this episode here. And they will have links to everything for you to listen to. We're going to be hearing lots more from William Bell in the years to come. So make sure you check out his current dates at williambellmusic.com and go see him live. In the meantime, enjoy my conversation with William Bell. One of the first things that I'm really curious to talk to you about, I guess, is growing up in Memphis, which I know, I think you live in Atlanta now, if I'm, if I'm right. correct about that. But uh, you grew up in Memphis, and um, I know that, you, that, that music in the church was a big part of your upbringing. And, and maybe you could tell me a little bit about what part of Memphis you were in and, and what that city and the music for, for you was like as a kid, just sort of growing up and coming up in that time. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Memphis and lived uh, about, actually about six blocks away from the uh, Stax uh, studio but okay. in the gardens there. So I grew up in Memphis and uh, started my career there, both uh, entertainment and uh, recording wise. Music for you, was it you were around music in the church, obviously, but was that sort of your main influence as a kid or were you hearing stuff on the radio that was like apart from that or what were, what were your influences? Yeah, uh, around six years old, I was in church. Uh, my mom sang in the church choir at Central Baptist, and um, I started in the church choir there about seven years old and uh, continued. And about nine, I was singing solo with the choir behind me. But that's been uh, my upbringing. And then um, I started a doo-wop group. During, that was during the 50s, late 50s. And... Uh, I started this do rock walk group called the Del Rios. Yeah. And um, we did uh, my first inkling to Stax Records. Chip Smolman, who was a producer for Stax at the time, asked me about singing backup on one of uh, Carla Thomas's records. And oh. I knew Carla and I knew her dad, Rufus, because he was a DJ at WDI and all that. And, um, so my vocal group, the Del Rios, and I did the backup work behind G Wiz. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah, and that's how uh, uh, Stax, you know, got wind of us. And uh, Jim Stewart liked the, the way we sounded and everything. And we signed with him uh, at an early age and did, uh, oh, I think about three singles that we did. 345 that we did, yeah. As the Del Rios. Yeah, as the Del Rios. 
So bef- before we jump into the stacks world, which obviously I'm really interested in, Carla Thomas, was she was she living in your neighborhood? Like, were you aware of her just sort of from around the city? Uh, I was aware of the Thomas family because Rufus was a comedian, actually. Really? He, yeah. He had a, a partner called Bones, and we had a theater on Beale Street uh, around the corner from where I worked at the Flamingo Room at the time. That's another story. Um, and uh, I, as a 14-year-old kid, could uh, go around to the on Wednesday nights, and they had an amateur night. Uh, Rufus was the MC, and he and Bone did comedy work and tap danced and all of that stuff. It's like vaudeville. A real showman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I got to know Rufus at an early age, and then I met his family. We Carla Marvell and. David Porter, uh, Isaac Hayes, we were all part of uh, a group on WDIA called the Teen Town Singers. So every Saturday, as a chorale group, we would uh, go down to WDIA and do a 15-minute song fest on on the radio. And right after that, B.B. King, who had his Pepticon show, would do it right after us. So oh I got to know BB and Bobby and all those guys. Yeah. So it was just uh, like going to university for me, just being around all of the iconic uh, players in Memphis at that time. It was such uh, a great scene. Oh, my God. Oh, man. They, they were older than I, and I was 14, and we got a 14. job uh, <laughs> after I won a talent contest. One of the rewards was – being able to go to Chicago and play the Club de Lisa up there. And Red Saunders' band was a friend. uh, He had a friend in Memphis, uh, Phineas Newborn Jr., who had a 14-piece orchestra at the Flamingo Room. Yeah. And uh, I went up and did a thing with Red Saunders and, So he was impressed enough to call Phineas back in Memphis and say, you need to look at this kid. Okay. And, and of course, uh, I got back and uh, Phineas asked me about working on weekends, like Friday night, Saturday, and maybe what they call tea dances on Sunday. It was like a fashion show and stuff in the afternoon on Sunday. So. I figured I could make a little money doing that. So that's what I did and started working me in the Del Rios on Friday and Saturday. And then I would do a solo thing because he had a big band, kind of like uh, Count Basie. And okay. uh, so I would do all of the standards and the jazz songs and, and Moonlight in Vermont and all that stuff with the big band as a solo on wow. Saturday, Sundays. <laughs> But uh, it was great, great tenure and great just an opportunity to work with uh, Hank Crawford. He was in the band that went on oh. to arrange for Ray Charles. Yep. Uh, Charles Lloyd was in the band. Man. Uh, Fathead Newman was in the band. So all of these guys were like 21, 22 years old. And, and Phineas Newborn Jr. was also in the band. So all these iconic jazz players were there, and they just taught me so much. And this was a Memphis-based band? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, on uh, uh, Bill and Hernando, there was a club called the Flamingo. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> around the corner was the Palace Theater where the Wednesday night shows would go on. And uh, Rufus asked me about me and Adele Rio doing – um, like coming on to uh, we could you could win uh five dollars if you won the contest. <laughs> Big money, man. So, yeah, so we <laughs> would go around, leave the club, and run around on Wednesday, and and perform on the talent show. And we won so much they stopped us from doing it. <laughs> 
Not you guys are <laughs> yes, we would win. You got barred from coming in after <laughs> yeah, a while. We got from <laughs> but um, we still had uh, come to the attention of uh, Chips by singing around town. Uh, Elvis had a friend, George Klein, who had a Christmas show on television every Christmas, and we could sing all of the intricate harmonies and like the four freshmen and stuff like that also, as well yeah. as the doo-wop stuff. And we would go and sing uh, on George Klein's show, who was Elvis's buddy, around on George Klein's show on the for the Christmas show. So we became known as a, the group around Memphis. Wow. So that's the Del Rios and you were you were doing like when you were playing at the at the Flamingo that you were just like a featured vocalist with that big band. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about those gigs. Like what was the what were the big band gigs like? Were they crazy or were they was it like kind of mellow? What were what was the general well, vibe it, in there? Yeah, it was jazz tunes kind of like uh, the Fount, uh, Count Basie, uh, Duke mm-hmm. Ellington big bands and um they would play all of the the standards, yeah. and um, then on Friday and Saturday they put <laughs> another hat on. They played all of the popular stuff that was on the radio. So okay, so me and the Del Rio would work on Friday and Saturdays, and then to do the jazz set, I yeah. worked with them on Sunday. And were those tunes that you knew growing up, or did you have to kind of sit down and learn a bunch of jazz oh, standards? No. <laughs> I had to learn them. And trust me, the, the older musicians, they were hard on me. Yeah. Uh, and I, I appreciate that uh, because after, on uh, Wednesday during the day, we would have uh, rehearsals. And after rehearsal, if I didn't sing a chord progression right or didn't get a chord straight on a certain song or a phrase right, they sat me down at the piano, taught me the chord. Uh-huh. I had to learn it and learn how to sing that passage in the, within that particular song. And come back on the next Wednesday, I had to do this without sitting at the piano. So yeah. it was just great. Uh, for me to learn all of this structure about harmonies. And uh, so I started in the high school taking music theory and in the chorale group and all that stuff. So I was just soaking up as much as I could musically back then. Yeah. And those guys, like they're legends now, of course, but back then they were just like a little older than you. They were just young adults. Uh, yeah. Were you, was it intimidating being around those guys? Like Fathead oh, yeah. and those kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they were just extraordinary uh, stellar musicians back then. I mean, yeah. Hank Crawford would play some of his solos and by himself, he would get the crowds worked up and everything. So, it was just a uh, pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to sit in with these guys. And they taught me so much. They were hard on me, uh, but nobody else could say anything about me. And right, they, right. Uh, they loved me. So they were doing it out of love. And uh, like I said, I would have to go over one passage in the song sometime for hours until I got it right. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the Beale Street scene back then? Like, if anyone knows Beale Street now, it's just kind of a crazy party yeah. frat house kind of scene. <laughs> but back then, like, that was a really vibrant scene oh, where the, all the great musicians were playing. They had so, we had one, two, three, the New Daisy, the Old Daisy, and the Palace Theater all in the same place. And then all up and down Beale Street, you had what we call the joints. I mean, yeah. So you could hear music coming out and it was always crowded down on Beale Street with local people back then going yeah. in and out of the places and they had restaurants down there. So it was a viable scene. You had another club where BB and Bobby used to play upstairs uh, called Club Handy. Where Bobby, Bobby Blue Bland? Bland yes. Yeah. And Junior Parker and oh, all man. these guys and Memphis Slim. So oh, this yeah. was the time when <laughs> these guys were still 
around, you know, and then you'd have guys come in from traveling uh, singers that were recording, like uh, Big Joe Turner and people like that, uh, that would come through. And uh, so I, I, just to meet these kind of people and for B.B. and Bobby to take me under their wing to teach me the ropes about entertainment. Yeah. Wonderful for a 14 year old kid. No doubt. And so were those places going like it's hard for me to picture. Were they going were they like late night joints or were they was it like afternoon music? What was happening? Well, like they would open up about noon. OK. And uh, some of them were uh, what to call beer joints and and places, but they'd have food and everything. So you'd have the lunches and everything where you could buy the liquor and the and the booze and everything and eat too. But they would open up about noon and they would go on until two or three in the morning before they closed. <laughs> okay, so not unlike it is now in that regard, I guess. Right, right. But you didn't have that many actual Tourists were intermingled, but yeah. not that many back then. It was yeah. just all local folk. This was the place where black people came for entertainment. Man, that must have been just an incredible time there. I can't oh, imagine. It, I, I look back on it, and, um, you know, of course, long before I got on the Beale Street, W.C. Handy and all of his crew wrote, uh, <laughs> you know, songs and stuff down there, and and people that I got to meet, all of the early elites, uh, I really got to meet those people, and they would come up. Even Elvis, he would come by the, when he was driving truck. He would come by the Flamingo Room, sit in the back of the room, and watch us perform. Sometimes. Wow, that's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you do you have any like really memorable? concerts or, or artists that you would have seen? I mean, there's so much going on and you were so surrounded by it, but were there a few things that really stuck it, stuck out in your mind as like some of the highlights of that era? Well, WDIA would have um, a concert every year to raise funds for the, for the privilege and everything. And we did uh, shows with, of course, Albert King and some of the people like that. But Lil Milton, but we also did uh, shows with uh, the monkeys came by. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm trying to think who else. Uh, it's just so many people, Glass Night and the Pips, um, and just a, a host of other people that uh, would come through town, Otis and Sam and Dave and all those people, of course. Yeah, uh, but we just would do those shows every year, and of course Rufus would put us on the show or put me on the show, and we were like the local talent that uh, yeah. would fit in with that. Yes, so amazing. So the Del Rios, tell me. So it was essentially like a duop style group, but was it also like soul stirrers influence, like gospel kind of stuff? Uh, that stuff really yes. intermingles, but what what was the what was the big influence for you guys as far as what that group was modeled after? Uh, most of us came out of church. Uh-huh. Uh, Louis Williams, uh, who went on to the do the ovations after I went solo. Okay, uh, he was with the group, uh, and David Brown, Harrison Austin, and we were all out of the church, but uh, we. Formed it, got together, and singing under the streetlights that night until the neighbors would run us in. <laughs> in yeah. my neighborhood, to give you an example, uh, uh, we lived on a mall, and two doors down was Maurice White from Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. David Porter was down, a little farther down, and all of these kind of people uh, were around, and uh, we just all knew each other. And uh, Memphis was kind of like a melting pot of upcoming talent back in those days. And um, when we all met up at that, as a matter of fact, Booker T. Jones and my family um, went to the same church for a while, Mount Nebo, <laughs> and he was the organist for the church. So 
when we got together at Stax, it was just like uh, homecoming. Just being, being at church, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I was always a fan of all of those gospel quartets. And even as a kid, I listened to Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirs. I even had a uh, chance when they were <laughs> stranded in Memphis because their car broke down. They had to sing around some local churches and stuff, you know, the, while they were there. Um, I got a chance to meet the, those guys, and oh, man. it was just awesome for a young kid to 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 be able to rub elbows and meet his yeah. heroes. And most of those guys were on the radio already, so yeah, that, so, was, <laughs> that was one of my goals. <laughs> was Sam Cooke a, like a good bunch of years older than you? Like I don't know how. Uh, Sam was probably eight or nine years older. But okay. he was a young man at the at, at the, in that time with the uh, Soul Stirs. He had been with them, I think, two or three years, and yeah. he had still been with them. And then, right after that, of course, he went secular with uh, uh, you send me, yeah. And, and the rest is history. Yeah, with he sure but did. I was, I was <laughs> listening to him long before that. So did you guys, as that group, as the Del Rios, did you have that thing happen where like you would perform in churches, but then you would also perform in nightclubs doing secular stuff? Or did you kind of like stick to one side of the, you kind of had to like do well, one or the other, right? In those days? Yeah. Uh, we never sang in church as a unit. Oh, okay. Del Rio. But we would do it during rehearsals and and out on the lawn sometimes, just, just for the neighborhood, just to see... I know how we sounded and how people would react. And then, of course, uh, the doo-wop thing, the Midnighters and the Clovers and Flamingos and all those guys during the doo-wop era, that was the thing back then. So we wanted to uh, make some money, so we started doing doo-wop. And uh, we even cut a couple of doo-wop songs with uh, Stax. Yeah, so so your first recording experiences were going in. I, I assume it was at the Stack Studio, but with the Del Rios. That was in like '57, I think, something like that. Yeah, but that was not the first one. My first okay. one, I was in the eighth grade, and <laughs> we were still very young. And um, I ran into uh, one of the Bahari brothers, uh, Les Bahari, and he had. Uh, uh, little bitty uh, recording studio out on Thomas okay. Street. And uh, I had some uh, family that lived in North Memphis. So I went to visit them and I wanted to see what the the place was like. It was a little tiny studio, but he wanted to cut a side on me and the Del Rio. So I wrote a song called Alone on a Rainy Night and the Del Rios and I uh, signed with him. Uh, we, I think, we were three years, two years, with one year option or something, and um, we signed with him. And uh, we, he put out the record, and it was popular in a tri-state area: Tennessee, yeah. Mississippi, Arkansas. Very popular among uh, the college crowd because we would do a lot of college dates with Phineas and band. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did that. That was my very first recording. Okay. And very so first song that I ever wrote that we recorded, <laughs> Alone on a Rainy Night. And uh, then, of course, uh, Chips had heard that song, because Rufus and some of the DIA jock played it and played it on WLOK with King Cole and it was playing all over Memphis and, and, and in the, on the radio. So, um, uh, that was one of the things that brought me to the attention of chips moment. Yep. Yep. Do you remember like going in to record, say a song like that? So you'd written the song. It was one of the first things that you'd written. One of the first things that you'd recorded would, was it done like all around one microphone? Like, do you remember what the session was actually like? Yes. Okay. <laughs> The lead singer was close to the mic and everybody else around the mic. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I was cleaning out some stuff the other day and I ran across a photo of the original Del Rio's 
And that was our first performance. Somebody, I don't know who took the photo, some of my family members. Uh, we were at a theater called the Ace Theater up on in South Memphis there on Mississippi Avenue. Mm-hmm. And that was our first, after being in the in the living room and places rehearsing, that was our first uh, live performance before an audience. Wow, and I, cool. yeah, I found that photo, so that's a precious photo. About it. Whoa, I bet. That's incredible. Yeah. So tell me about the, your songwriting thing, because so uh, for a lot of vocalists from your era, songwriting wasn't really a, necessarily a part of what they did. But for you, it's obviously been a huge part of your life. Like, was was that always something that you were interested in? And like, how, what made you aware of being a songwriter or how to do it even? Well, I was an only child uh, up until I was 10 years old. And uh, I was kind of a loner. And... It was uh, escapism for me to write what I was feeling down. And I wrote poems. (laughs) And uh, when I started at the Flamingo Room, they were teaching me chords on the piano. So I started writing songs. On the piano. Yeah, on the piano. And uh, so uh, that was how I got started at it, because it was like an expression for me to get my feelings out. Yeah. You know, because I didn't have a, a lot of friends. I think throughout uh, uh, grammar and high school, I had three friends that hung with, hung with me the whole time. <laughs> so that was it. Okay. And so, I mean, did you feel like that was something that you wanted to pursue? Like as a, did you even, were you even aware that that could be like a career path? <laughs> Well, uh, I had not thought of it in that sense back then. Right. uh, Because I didn't really know the ins and outs of the music business. Yeah, of course. A little later on, after my first record, I had a conversation with Sam Cooke, by the way. (laughs) And he taught me that you could make money in production and publishing and all that stuff and songwriting. But um, I just wrote just as an escape. Uh, and I didn't really know that you could really sit down. My mom wanted me to become the first uh, doctor in the family. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> what a disappointment! <laughs> uh, I know, I know. And she was kind of apprehensive about uh, old man Phineas had to sit with her and tell her that I've got two of my kids in the band and I'll take care of him the same as I would my kids. And he did. Yeah. Um, but that's the only reason that she um, uh, let me work at the Flamingo Room on the weekend. But one of the stipulations was, I don't care what time you get home on Sunday morning, you're going to church. And mm-hmm. it was that. if I got home at uh, four o'clock in the morning, after <laughs> dropped up at seven o'clock, you're up. You out. You're going to church. So yeah, well, stipulations. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> what was the path for you as a songwriter? Um, you know, like you, the first song that I'm really aware of of you doing is "You Don't Miss Your Water," which is probably sixty or sixty one. I can't remember the exact year, but um, yeah. okay, so sixty one. So. Up to that point, had you written like hundreds of songs or was that like a, a, one of the earliest songs you ever wrote or what was your, were you, were you writing all the time? Did you have a huge catalog at that point or what was the, what was, what was that like Absolutely. for you? Absolutely. I had a whole, uh, one of those old, uh, uh, corrugated, uh, booklets that I wrote oh, yeah. all the time. So I had a whole booklet of lyrics and I had okay. melodies in my head. Yeah. Uh, I had written uh, three songs for Stax. Uh, There's a Love, who uh, was covered by Sha Na Na. And okay. <laughs> so that taught me kind of that I could make money as a songwriter. Yeah. Um, when Jim Stewart signed us back in those days, all everything was all inclusive in a contract. They signed you as an artist. They sign you up for publishing and as a songwriter. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, as a kid, you don't know the business. So sure. 
we uh, the first five years I was signed up like that, and uh, but I did get a chance to write songs for Albert King and different people at Stax, Luf, Rufus, and uh, uh, so it was it was not all in vain. And I, I to this day, I thank uh, Jim for giving us neighborhood kids a platform just to, to get our mm-hmm. careers off the ground. But um, I um, would write just to get my ideas out and, and my feelings out. And then uh, when we started with Stack, we cut, uh, I think, a total of six songs, them mm-hmm. on two-sided 45s with Jim Stewart. And then um, most of the guys in the Del Rio were older than uh, I was and L- Lewis was. So they were drafted. That's when the draft was. They were drafted oh. in, in the military. Okay. So after they got drafted, that left a duo <laughs> for yeah. me and Lewis to sing. And we did the duo for a while with, uh, old man Phoenix. We tried to work in a couple of other singers to go along with that, but nothing just really clicked. And yeah. of course, I ran into Chips, and he asked me about doing a, a a project solo for Stax, and I had never thought of it before because I had the group. And uh, but I started thinking about it, and I went on tour with during the summer with. Uh, this is during 60, 1960. Mm-hmm. I had gotten out of uh, school and everything, and I figured, well, I got to make enough money to start the college, and if I'm going to become a doctor and all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went on the road during the summer with Old Man Phineas. We played the Catskills up in New York and different Amazing. places, and even played a couple of these uh, circuses. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I, uh, Pretty Girl is like a melody. I, I would sing <laughs> some wow. of that. Them. Yeah. And so I've had a, a weird career, but uh, worked with him that that summer. So when I came back, I ran into Chips in a grocery of all places. And he said, are you ready to uh, work on something for uh, Stax as a solo artist? And he was really wanting to work with me. And I'm saying, well, I've got one song that I wrote during the summer on the road when I was in New York. And it was You Don't Miss Your Water, actually. And uh, I read him off the lyrics. And he said, well, come by the studio and let me take my guitar. and We'll sit down and uh, and you play the chord structure. And, and and let's see if we you want to record this. I said, well, I need at least two or three other songs. So I had to sit down uh, in a couple of days and write a couple of more songs. And I finally went over to the studio and met with Chips. And we did a demo of You Don't Miss Your Water. Of course, it sounded very gospel-y. Uh-huh like a church song and kind of country because that's what we heard in Memphis on one, one station. Of course you heard country jazz, gospel, R and B and blues all on one station. And uh, so, and I was a big country fan because like I said, we, as the Del Rio, we used to do backup work behind uh, Dickie Lee and, and uh, oh, wow. people like that, man, and and uh, Bill Browder, who was uh, <laughs> T.G. Shepard later on. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so we did the, a lot of backup stuff for some of the country singers when they were cutting demo stuff, did some commercials for Pepper Tanner and, because we could sing the intricate harmonies and stuff. Yeah. That's how we, as a group, we were, how good we were, so... We went to Stax and cut that demo. Jim Stewart didn't love it. He said it t- sounded too much like a gospel song. Okay. Which it did. Yeah. Um, so Chips took it up to Mrs. Axton up in the record shop. She had a record shop in the front of the studio. Right. And she played it, and she had a speaker out on the sidewalk that she would place stuff and 
that the neighborhood kids could dance to or listen to. And then yeah. she'd come out and and question them. How do you like that? Do you like the lyrics? Do you like the beat? Okay, so she was sort of like gauging the gauging yes, the, the crowd. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And she had her finger on the pulse of what was commercial. And she knew that this uh, was a different sound and it was not gospel. It was more like because Sam Cook had put out uh, You Send Me. Mm-hmm. And she knew, said, well, this is a different sound. So there was no such thing as Southern Soul ballads back then. Right. So she w- went to Jim and they went back and forth and, and between Chips, Miss Axton, and they finally prevailed with Jim to put it out. So as, he, it, as it was, or did he re-record yeah, it? And, and almost a demo. What they did was Marvell Thomas, Rufus's son, played keyboards on it. Oh, I wondered who. Who's, that's a great yeah. piano part. Yeah, it's gospel all the way. Yeah, man. And um, of course, um, yeah. Who else plays on it? Do you remember? Who uh, Louis Steinberg was bass because he was okay. part of the MGs back then. And yeah, pre pre Duck Dunn bass, right? Was yeah, it? and then they brought Booker in to play organ. Yeah, and uh, because I they were asking me, well, what do we do? We need a different sound on this. And then I said, well, Booker, you know, he plays organ for the church. Let's bring him in. So they brought Booker in to play organ on it. And it just clicked. They put it out, yeah. I think, in November 61. Yeah. And uh, nothing happened that much. It played around Memphis. Yeah. Nothing happened. And But during um, the Christmas, a lot of the jocks were still playing it. Don't miss your water in certain cities, New Orleans being one, Baton Rouge and uh-huh. Different places, Texas, Houston. And uh, right after Christmas in January, it just blossomed. Really? And, so it took that long? Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, Jim was getting called, wanted to know if I could come do some DJ performances. And, yeah. And uh, so they had a performance uh, at a high school for a bunch of kids in St. Louis and wanted me to come up there along with uh, Duke of Earl, Gene Chandler. <clears throat> so Chips and I got in Chips' little uh, sports car, a Triumph, with <laughs> convertible, <clears throat> and we drove from Memphis to uh, uh, St. Louis, and I think it rained on us <laughs> all the way <laughs> as the rain was coming through the top of the <laughs> – convertible there so but it yeah. ran all the way to st louis on us and oh, man. So we got there and we did the concert and the jocks just uh it was a big thing for the jocks up there and then our first number one market was new orleans oh really okay yeah <clears throat> and uh it went number one in new orleans and it just spread after that and of wow. course I started getting called to do. Uh, I was supposed to go to college in in the start first of the year, and I was getting calls to go do concerts, and the money was good, so I figured, well, I can always go to college next semester. <laughs> right. So I opted to uh, do do the, the concerts. Yeah. And I did. I made a lot of money. I was booked up for about nine months straight and got a an agency out of New York, the Universal Attraction, to sign me up and played the Apollo. Wow. And, and while at the Apollo, I uh, got a call from my mom, and um, she said, "There's a letter here from from uh, the the you know the army." Uh-oh. I said, "Did you open it?" And she said, "No." I said, "Well, open it and read it." And of course, it was greetings because I didn't go to college, I didn't start school. Right. So you were at the top of the list. I was at the top of the list. <laughs> so I figured, well, I got nine months of all these concerts to do from 
New York to California. Let me see if I can get a deferment for that time frame, and then I'll go and do my time in the Army. Yeah. And, of course, when I got through at the Apollo and I had another couple of uh, theater dates uh, to do in Baltimore and Washington, <laughs> so when I got through, I was two weeks behind from the greeting. And when I got to Memphis, I flew into Memphis on a little thing. I said, well, I got a couple of days off. Let me fly in and go to the draft board, get a deferment. It didn't happen. Oh, oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went down. I had just bought me a brand new Pontiac. Drove down, went in, talked to the desk sergeant. He said, oh, you are late. He said, you were supposed to have been here two weeks ago. And so he said, yeah. I said, well, I want to talk to somebody about getting a deferment. So he said, step right into this room, beer. Yeah. And so when I got in there, there were five or six other guys in there. And uh, the first thing they did, uh, another sergeant in there said, raise your hand. And, of course, I didn't know what was going on. Raise your right hand. And I took the oath. <laughs> right then and, and there. So then I asked him after doing that, because he said, we're going to have to step into another room and we're going to take you down to the place where we get our shots and everything. I said, well, no, I need to talk to someone. <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So he, he said, you're in the army. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, man. Hey, too late. I had <laughs> signed up. Oh, my God. Taking the oath. So <laughs> I went back and gave my keys to the desk sergeant out there. I said, uh, I'm going to have to call my uncle and have him come and oh my God. get the car because they wouldn't give me a chance to even take the car home. So I said, okay. They put us on a bus, uh, went out to the VA hospital. We got all of our shots and everything. The next morning, we were in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Oh, my God. So <laughs> did you was this even occurring to you that this might happen? Or were you just like, oh, I'll, I'll get out of it somehow. It's not, well, not going to happen. Well, I, I was not trying to get out of it. It was just that I figured, well, I've got all these dates. I can make money. So at least yeah. I can for my college education. I don't have to have, be a bird no mom, you know. And so that was what I was figuring. They'll give me enough time to play these dates, and then I'll come back and go in the military. No way. So I oh, had man. I, not a clue. <laughs> Whoa. Just so I understand, when you're performing, were you doing, like, completely solo shows, or were you part of, like, one of those Stax reviews? Or what was what was your performance situation, and who were you playing? Like, who was in your band at that point? Uh, well, you know, when I was doing shows, yeah, just before doing the army thing, like was had, that just before the army? After I found out that there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, an interest in in booking me and, and stuff, yeah. because the record went number one in just about every city, yeah. and it was hot. So, of course, um, Jim wanted to promote it more and more. So I started doing shows. So I formed a four piece rhythm section. Okay. With organ, guitar, drums, and uh, bass, not, not bass, the uh, organ, guitar, drums, and I think uh, I had um, one horn. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I worked with yep. for a, a long time, and that's what I was working with. Uh, but at the Apollo, they put the house band, which was King Curtis's band. Oh, man. Yeah, they put the house band behind it because they uh, wanted a big sound and sure. all of that stuff. So uh, during those, those dates, but my band joined me when I worked uh, in Baltimore there at the Royal and then the Howard Theater in uh, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but... Uh, at the Apollo, the King Curtis was like the house band, so I worked there with him. So you just basically had to tell everyone, like, "Sorry, guys, you're like the gigs, yeah, gigs, gigs are uh, off. No, I gotta, I, I, I gotta go to training." I, I shared some of my 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 earnings with them just to keep them intact, you know. But yeah, they were able to work around some of the local clubs and things in Memphis. And what year was this that you got drafted? Uh, sixty two. At the top, okay. of, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually went into the military, I think it was June of 62. Okay. And um, then, um, of course, uh, I did uh, some basic training and AIT training, advanced training at Fort Polk uh, in Louisiana. Yeah. And, of course, I uh, ran into uh, Alan Toussaint there. He was at Fort Polk at the, at the same time. Really? And we knew each other, so it wasn't all bad. So how did how did you know Alan? Was he part of the big band scene, well, sort of, at that time? Well, no, he was just a keyboard player and a writer, songwriter around New Orleans. And Udoma Shawada went number one. That was the first city that it actually went number one in was New Orleans. So he and, was hip to your to your songs through that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. he was up to the song, and I played New Orleans uh, promoter down there, Percy Stovall. I played, uh, he would he took 10 dates on me, and we worked all the way from Houston, Texas, to Lafayette, New Orleans, down wow. to Mississippi, all the way to Pensacola, that whole coastline. Yeah. So uh, on 10 dates, and so Alan uh, was writing – songs and stuff down there at the time amazing and so he he was constricted conscripted at the same time you were yeah yeah crazy whoa uh and so how long were you in the army for for two years uh, i spent uh uh six months uh three months for uh, uh advanced training and three months for the initial training and then uh, i went back and Stacks wanted me to come home on furlough before I had to go overseas uh, to do some, to do as many singles <laughs> that I could. Yeah. So I went home to do that. And, and so uh, did you did you pack in a bunch of sessions in that? I did. I, that's what I did the whole time I was home. I didn't really experience any kind of life. I was in the studio all day and night sometimes. So and, there's all those there's all those great singles around that time like Formula of Love and I Told You So and all those songs was that in that period like pre going off to the uh, army? Uh, yeah, that was during okay. that first, that first five year period. But I wrote a lot of that, and uh, then I got with uh, Steve and Steve Cropper and I wrote uh, Marching Off the War and a couple of soldier songs and stuff. Yeah. And they wanted me to do as many forty fives as I could so that they could kind of release those and keep me alive. Uh, yeah. I was in the military, but I ran into it. That was during the time I ran into Otis Redding when he came in, uh, driving for Johnny Jenkins for a session. Really? <laughs> and, uh, he and I met while just before I went off to overseas. And when I got back, of course, Otis was a big star then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, Rufus was a big star, so I had to play catch up. I was a <laughs> <laughs> so you you were in the army for two, like how like you were overseas for how long in total? Like uh, over a year? For, for, for two years total. Whoa. Uh, uh, half uh, half of a year, six months for training, and then I was shipped to Hawaii. And over there on the, at the on the fourteenth infantry, we were like jungle fighters. We trained up in the Kahukas and places like that for jungle fighting. And then Whoa. just before I was short time and I was we did some helicopter rescues. You know, we'd go over and do helicopter rescues and come back. But then my whole unit was shipped over just I was uh, what they call a short timer. So I only had two months to go <laughs> in the military. So they didn't send me over. And oh, I had, okay. and plus I had gotten married. So they didn't ship me over and they, they sent me home uh, uh, during that, after that two months was up. But, oh, that's lucky. So that, so that was the end of it. Like you, you were done at that point. Yeah. But most of my outfits and everything, the 14th, they were shipped to Vietnam. Yeah. So you never actually had to go to Vietnam. Well, we went for a couple of helicopter rescue, uh, rescue, oh. and back. Yeah. Crazy. But never, 
on the uh, front lines or so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So you you got back to to Memphis and just tell me a little bit about your life at that point as part of the Stax world. Like I'd love to know what the what the day to day activity was like there. Was was it just constant sessions? Was Booker T and Steve Cropper and and I guess Duck Dunn at that point, Al Jackson were those guys all around there all the time? What was it like? You know, from we were day to day? a factory. <laughs> yes, we yeah. were back then tell me uh, about that when i first got back from the military of course you know uh, they had all of these uh sam and dave otis rufus and carla and and uh, all of these acts were like major acts back then yeah and so i'm coming back from the military i'd been overseas for a year and a half and I really wasn't up on what was happening musically back in the States. Mm-hmm. So um, a couple of people tried to write stuff for me. I think David and Isaac wrote a couple of songs for me. Uh, Steve and I wrote a couple of things. It, it just nothing clicked. <clears throat> so I asked uh, Jim, I said, well, let me just uh, put my ears to the radio, find out musically what's going on now after two years and uh because all, all in hawaii all i heard was surfing music and and stuff like that and and hawaiian music you know right yeah <laughs> big big difference from from the, yeah, the streets of, of memphis <laughs> soul music yeah especially our music and um so that's what i did and jim agreed so and i noticed that the songs that i was getting from other writers, they meant well, but I was getting the songs that the other artists had turned down. Then, okay. well, let, let's see if William can do this song, you know. Yeah. And they just really didn't fit me. So I'm saying, okay, I'm getting the secondhanded songs here. Let me yeah. just sit back and sit here and write something. So I wrote uh, Feeling the Way I Was, not angry, but just realizing. I'm not getting the cream of the crop of these, <laughs> these songs. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote Everybody Loves a Winner. And, of course, when I recorded it, uh, Booker and I uh, recorded it, and uh, that was my first hit after getting out of the military. And tell me about that session, because that's a killer song. The vocal's incredible. There's, like, all these great strings on it. Like, how was that session done? Do you remember the, the actual recording? Yeah, uh, they had, of course, Al Jackson, Booker, and Duck and Steve at that time as the rhythm section. And I think uh, they had uh, Floyd Newman and uh, I think the horn player was, um, yeah, it, it was the, the regular Memphis horns, the horn player there. And um, so they had the three piece horn section. Yeah, and uh, Booker would uh, uh, sometimes play trombone on it because he played about. Oh, really? Oh, he was the kind of musician that everybody hated because he played <laughs> about eight or nine instruments fluently, <laughs> <laughs> and he was just a good arranger. Uh huh. And um, would he have arranged the strings for that song too? Yeah, he did. Okay. And uh, we, uh, I think that was one of his. Uh, it's either that song, I think that was the first one that we used strings from the Memphis uh, Symphony. Oh, on, okay. And then we used them out on, uh, on uh, I Forgot to Be a Lover. Sure. On that also. But uh, yeah, he and I, so, but that was my first hit. And um, so, so in those kind of stacked sessions, that were in like essentially what used to be a, a movie theater. I would imagine the band is all playing in the same room together. Were you singing with them or do you like, did you overdub your vocals or how did that go down? Well, uh, initially what we would do, work up the song yeah. with the rhythm section. Um, then you go up in the top of the uh, studio there where they had the sound breakers and you put the vocal on while they recorded the 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 track, which okay. is the rhythm track. 
Yeah. And uh, of course, so they would use your your vocal, and sometimes the, the first vocals were the key vocals, you know, sure. because it was just uh, instantaneous the creativity and everything. Yep. And then if there was a flaw or something, if the rhythm track was solid, then uh, we did have eight tracks at that time. But okay. For a long time, we started out with two tracks, but yep. we had to cut the vocals and the band at the same time. Yep. And that instilled a lot of discipline, <laughs> as you can imagine. Man, eight, eight, eight tracks is pretty cutting edge for that time. That must have oh, been one of the, yeah, one of the we, first studios to have that. <laughs> we thought we were big time then. Yeah. So we, we graduated from two track to four track, and then we had, had eight tracks, and that was like, heaven because you could you could uh, if you didn't get your vocal right you could redo it you could put your background vocals on and yeah. you could really get a gist of what the song was going to be yeah and so that was big time stuff back in those days totally so were you doing singles ju- like specifically for the sake of of doing a 45 a and b side or because that the soul of a bell came out in 67 or whatever were you making an album like how did it work back then was it singles compiled an album or were you making an album from the top? Actually, we were doing singles. Okay. Uh, we did just uh, 45s and Jim's idea, he wanted to have enough hit singles that would uh, draw an interest to the LP. And okay. um, so I did that. I did uh, back then um Another song, I'm trying to think of what it was, but I forgot to build your level. Excuse me, one of those sessions. And um, I think after I forgot to be your lover, he decided, well, we need to uh, try, or before I forgot to be your lover, he decided to cut some uh, songs. I think I did uh, a couple of copy songs and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, doing an LP because he felt like I was doing so much touring and and then my fan base was growing, so we needed an LP. So, of course, we did an LP. And then right after the LP, I did uh, I Forgot to Be Your Lover. <laughs> and, yeah. it, and then, of course, uh, that helped the LP and it helped uh, me – keep working and everything for yeah. sure for sure um what was the what was the general vibe in the studio between the mg's band was it like a very fun kind of joke like they worked so much together was it like oh, yeah. a, a fun atmosphere in there or was it like all business or what was the general vibe in the stack studio no we 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 had fun we, yeah. we really did it was it was like a family unit inside the confines of stacks uh, we didn't care about race. We didn't care about gender. We didn't care about anything. It's what you brought to the table in terms of creativity. Yeah. And uh, so it was fun, but uh, it was also work. Uh, everybody there was like a stickler for getting everything just right, not just settling. Right. And if, if everybody was not in tune to a, a take, okay, let's do it one more time. And I think me as a vocalist, <laughs> sometimes when they said, that's it, I said, no, I want to do it one more time. Yeah. So, um, and sometimes I did it to my satisfaction, but sometimes the, the first take was the best. You know, sure. yeah. I'm saying, okay, I, I hear something in my head that I want to make sure that um, I get right, but... Um, uh, it was not always the case, but uh, we had some good ears uh, in, in that rhythm section between Steve, Duck, Al, and, and Booker. Yeah, man. Well, yeah. Was Booker was Booker sort of calling the shots, or was it a very uh, was it a very um... Um, ryth- rhythmically? Al would call the shot. Booker okay. was, Booker was more or less the arranger guy. Yep. But Al was like a metronome, man. He was. When he established a rhythm, man, that dude. Yes, and um, 
So he would handle the rhythm. Booker was more or less the arranger and and everything on on the sessions. And of course, uh, the creative stuff with Steve and Duck to create uh, uh, bass lines and and some of the greatest pros and stuff. It was just unbelievable. These guys played on probably. 90% of the stuff that came out of Stacks for four or five years and different type of artists, male, female, vocal groups and groups, and everything was totally creatively different. Man. So did they see you more as an artist or more of an asset to as a songwriter? What, what do you, how do you think they viewed you? <laughs> I don't know how Jim stood so I think, um, cause the other artists, uh, was so fantabulous and I was Jim told me just before he died, he said, one of my regrets was not giving you the promotion and stuff that you deserve. Because I was like a triple threat. I was yeah. write the songs, I could sing the song and perform the songs. And um so he utilized me as a utility man. But I was signed to him basically as an artist. Right. Uh, I didn't get into the production. I I worked on a lot of production, mm -hmm. but I didn't get that because I was not really a producer for it. Booker was the producer. Al, Steve, and Duck were producers. Yeah. I was signed as an artist, but I was also signed up as a writer because it was all in, inclusive that first five years. Now, when I re-signed, of course, I renegotiated my contract. I had learned a little bit about the business. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, took the writers and, and publishing clause out of the contract and just oh. signed as an artist. Yeah. But I knew that I could write, and some of the artists would ask me to write stuff for them. Uh, okay. I knew I got a sure thing for All in the Nightingale. Uh, stuff for Carla, for Ruth. So it's like I could write and Jim would tell me we got so-and-so coming in uh, in two days. Uh, you want to submit some songs? And of course, mm -hmm. I, yeah. And did you get to keep part of the, the writing share of that stuff or did they just like take all that stuff at that time? Uh, initially, they took it all. Whoa. Uh, later on, when I renegotiated, we got paid as I got paid as an artist mm -hmm. the first five years, yeah. not as a, a publisher, producer, uh, or nothing, a writer. Uh, I signed with BMI, and of course, uh, then I would get uh, airplay monies, but yeah. not not uh, writer royalty. Ooh, that's just not but, good. I know, but after I renegotiated, because <laughs> uh, I was on tour and I ran in, actually in Atlanta here, I ran into Sam. Uh, he was playing a date for my manager. I had signed management with a managing company here in Atlanta. And uh, I ran into Sam on the avenue here. And he was telling me about production and and, and publishing. And, and it was like, Lights went off. You know, you can make money with publishing. How? <laughs> so, <laughs> tell uh, me. Tell me. Yeah. So um, all of that stuck with me. And yeah. I wanted to learn about, I was one of these artists. If I were not on tour, I was in the studio mm -hmm. 100% all the time, day and night. I wanted to learn all of the in and outs of uh recording how do you mic drums how do you mic this or what does this fader do uh you know how do you put the echo where and what so yeah. all of that i was just like going to university i was studying and yeah. cramming it all in because i wanted to, to learn all of the ins and outs of, of the business behind right these. Yeah. That's so cool, man. Um, do you do you have a, a favorite recollection of Otis Redding? You you mentioned Otis, and of course he was like you know one of the. But he died so young that you know there's not a lot known about that guy. But but you must have had some good hangs with him over the years. Yeah, we uh, 
Uh, well, when I first met him, we had a place called the Four Way Inn, and I was home on furlough just before going overseas. And I had done sessions all that morning. And that afternoon, Johnny Jenkins was coming in. And uh, so, like I said, I was around the studio and I didn't know uh, what was what. So when Johnny came in, Otis was driving Johnny. He was not the artist. And he was just uh, the driver. <laughs> so, but he and I hit it off and got to talking because I was coming into Atlanta, but I had never been to Macon. And he is, was, where, is he from Macon? Uh, yeah. Okay. And so he was saying, well, I'm from Macon. I, have, yeah, I said, well, I've never been to Macon. Well, you have to come to Macon, man. Well, I'll show you around and that kind of thing. Uh-huh. So I, uh, he, we wanted to eat uh, lunch. So he well, has a good place to eat. He wanted some soul food. So the four-way, I told him about the four-way. Yeah. So we went up to the four-way in my car and, and had some good soul food up there. And he loved that place. And, oh, man, I got I to gotta make sure I find out how to get in. So he and I hit it off. Uh-huh. Uh, then later on, when I got out of the military and uh, – Got my first hit, uh, Everybody Loves a Winner. He and I did some uh, touring together, just a, a two-act oh. thing. Yep. Me and Otis and uh, uh, Alan and Phil Walden and his driver, Speedo, we would <laughs> ride in the same car and the gig to gig, you know, and, yeah. and we became really close. After we weren't performing, we'd I'd go to Macon, I'd go down to Macon and spend three or four days with him, and we would go to all of these clubs and joints and things and set people up with beers and stuff, and just, he was so approachable <laughs> to yeah. people, and... Uh, we would set people up and just have a good time laughing and talking with the the people there of, of Macon. And, uh, of course, we became really good friends. I met his family and and, and everything. And uh, we uh, were good friends. And then uh, the day that he did uh, Dock of the Bay, I happened to be in the studio. Whoa. And uh, I was supposed to have had a gig in Chicago at the Tivoli. And uh, so he, at, at the end of the thing, because Otis had been in the hospital for uh, getting some polyps removed from his voice, and he was a little bit apprehensive about that, you know, because Dock of the Bay was a different kind of song. Yeah. It was not that hard edge drive thing that he would do, and he didn't know how the, the Otis Redding fans would take it. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so he was a little apprehensive about that. We talked about that. And then he said, well, I got a gig to do, and I think it was somewhere in Ohio. And then he said, well, why don't you go with me to my gig, and then I'll drop you. He had it on plane. I'll drop you off in Chicago for your gig, and that way you don't have to try to, you know, you can just get the flight back, but I can drop you off in Chicago and then go, go on to uh, Wisconsin. And I'm saying – Okay, but then that night I get a call from my promoter in Chicago. It was just uh, storming and snow everywhere, you know. So yeah. my gig was canceled. And uh, so I had to call Otis at the hotel and tell him that uh, I'm not going to make it. And he was still saying, well, why don't you just go on my gig? Well, I'll just stay home. My wife was after me for staying home for a while, you know? So I said, yeah. oh, I'll stay home and just spend a week with her since my gig is canceled. And that's what I did. So, Oh my God. This, so you were supposed to be on that plane. Yeah. This was Friday. Oh this was Friday night. Um, and, uh, he went and played a gig with him in the bar case on, I think it was a Saturday in either Cleveland or somewhere in Ohio. At a, at a at a date, and uh, then the next day, that Sunday, uh, I was watching TV in my den at home, 
And one of our mutual friends in Milwaukee, a disc jockey, called me. And he said, uh, have you heard about Otis? And O.C. was kind of a jokester kind of guy. And um, I said, no, what happened? He had a great gig and everything and fell out the crowd. He said, no, Otis's plane just crashed. And I'm going, come on, man, don't don't uh, play like that. Yeah. No, no, he, he was in the radio station on the ticker tape at that time. And it was coming across the ticker tape. Now, this oh, is about five in the afternoon or 530 or something like that. And uh, so I'm watching TV and I don't see anything on TV. And as I'm talking to OC in Milwaukee, Across the bottom end of the uh, TV, the little scroll was going, Otis Redding, plane crash. And uh, I don't remember any much after that. I just hung the phone up on OC. And and I was thinking at the time, I said, well, Otis is a good swimmer. Um, he'll be able to, you know, get out of it and everything. And because uh, he had the bar caves were my. I had a club in Memphis called the Tiki Club at the time, and that's where Otis first saw the bar case. Really? And, yeah. And so they were like my little house band, and I had to get permission from their parents for them to work on the weekends for me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> and it does. And, uh, so they were my house band, so Otis was in town uh, for session one week and he came up to the club and because uh, a lot of musicians if they were in town they'd always come by and hang out at the Tiki Club and uh, he heard the house band and wanted to know who they were and so then the next thing I knew James Alexander the leader said uh, Otis want us to go uh, on the road and, and play for him and, and of course uh I said, well, I'm not going to hold you back. If you got that opportunity, <laughs> go, you know. Yeah. And so I knew that they were on that pl flight with uh, – oh. And so it was like all of these young kids, they were 14, 15, 16 oh. old, and it, I was just devastated. I got in my car. I don't know to this day where I went. Because it was when I got out to go, got out, left the house to get in my car. It was just like dust dark, and um, I was driving around, and I don't remember not one thing: freeway, streets, stop signs. I don't remember a thing until I pulled up in the front of Stacks, and that's like about eight o'clock at night. So I must have driven around. Memphis <laughs> for hours for two hours or three and don't remember I can't tell you this day where I went but I did remember understandable I, yeah and uh, all the lights were on and nobody was there I think Jim and Al were in Vegas or somewhere at a uh, meeting or something and uh, but uh, some of the clerical people were there and everybody was crying and everything and they still hadn't found Otis's body they had found some of the bodies but they hadn't found his yet oh, man what tragedy can you also from that from that era can you tell me about um writing born under a bad sign I mean I, I know that that song was was done by so many people was that a song that you that you wrote for somebody else or was that written for yourself as an artist actually I had I had that song for myself originally uh -huh. okay and uh, i was in the studio again because that's where i was if i was not on tour yeah and albert had a session albert king and, yeah albert king yeah. and uh after the session he didn't have enough material songs and jim asked if anybody had any songs that might be good for albert and I had started this song. I had a bass line. And, uh, what a uh, bass line. Come yeah, on. I had that bass line and I had a verse and the chorus. 
And that's all I had. I hadn't finished it. And so I, I told Jim about that song. He said, well, why don't you just sing what you've got for Albert and see if, if he would like it. So I sang it a cappella for Albert there, and I played the bass line, and then Booker was sitting at the piano down, and so he started adding chords to it. So, and uh, and uh, he put the bass line on it. Albert loved the song, but it was not a completed song. So yeah. um, Jim asked uh, Albert if he could stay over another day, and I always said, yes, but I'll have to leave tomorrow afternoon, so it would have to be an early session in the morning. Yeah. So, uh, Jim asked me, well, can you get this song completed for tomorrow's session? <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, I think so. And so Booker said, well, we can go over to my house. I've got a piano over there in, in my den. So... And he was closer to the studio than my house was. And uh, so I went to Booker's house, and we sat up in his den all night, finished the song, and I was trying to figure out something that I could write for a second verse, and I knew that Albert didn't read or write. And uh, I said, well, I, I'm trying to write something that he would identify with. Uh -huh. That was the start of my second verse and, and everything. Oh, and, so you were you were really tailoring it to Albert King. Yeah, and I, I really tailored it for him. Okay, cool. So came in the next morning, I sang it down for him, I had the lyrics, and um so <laughs> I was laying the lyrics up on the, the, the little sheet holder up there in front of Albert. And said, you're going to have to call off the, the lines to me after they did a track. They yeah. did a track, Booker laid the track, and then I, I was going to put, we were going to put Albert's voice on. So I had to stand in back of Albert, whisper in his ear. No way. The lines. You're like, that, you're like I've been down ever since I was 10. <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> but he nailed it. I mean, he sure did. He nailed it. And once they got his vocal on and uh, they were asking uh, him to put some of his iconic guitar work on. And when he started the guitar work, it just clicked. Everything just fell into place. And of course, at that point, it was Albert's song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no denying it. Right. Uh, and then not long after that, I mean, the, when when a when that version, like the Cream version, comes out, I mean, that's like a huge selling record. Does that make a did, does that make a, an impact on you and your life? Like, did you make a bunch of extra money and stuff off that, or was it kind of like one of those things where none of that filtered down to you in those days? Well, it did. It it, it made yeah. an impact because at that time I had renegotiated my contract for songwriter royalties. Oh, good. And stuff like that, you know. Uh, uh, Stack still held on to the publishing, but yeah. I was getting songwriters royalties from it. Oh, good. Okay. When Eric Clapton and Cream and Jack Bruce cut it, uh, of course they brought it to mainstream. Alice had number one record on it, but they brought it to mainstream to where. Uh, every genre of music besides blues and everything was listening to it. So we made a lot of money and we still make a lot of money off of that particular song. Did did writing a song like that, like when when Cream did it and, and it was like a huge international record, that whole album was so well known, did that uh, impact you in the sense of like, were, were you getting opportunities to, you know, record or write for people that came out of that? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Quite a bit. Um, and I had started a uh, record label with my management in Atlanta called mm -hmm. Peace Tree Records. Yep. And so we had about six acts that I was producing and writing for uh, in Atlanta. 
I mean, you've had such a fascinating career, and and what's interesting to me is you've had also this sort of later resurgence too. And in the last few years, you did the the great record with John Leventhal, "This Is Where I Live," and then you've got this brand new record out, "One Day Closer to Home." And I'm just wondering if you could tell me just a little bit about the process of, say, with the new record. Um, I've only had a chance to listen to it a couple times, so I don't know it as well yet. But I, I love it, and it's um, it's just got some great energy to it. And I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about, you know, this this later period working with John on the one before. And I don't even know who produced this new record because I, I don't have the credits for it, so I can't see. But um, can you tell me a bit about the process and what the yeah. what these two records have, have meant to you? Yeah. Um... Actually, my management, uh, Charles Dreamy from Blind Ambition, hooked me up with uh, John Leventhal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was a um, match made in heaven, you might say, because um, yeah, man. he was uh, a big fan of mine. And, of course, he's such a an iconic um, producer, writer. And, and, of course, he's done his wife. Uh, you know, Roseanne. He, yeah, Roseanne and and different artists that and and he was just amazing as a musician, as a producer, and he came to uh, uh, Atlanta, met with me at mm-hmm. my studio, and we talked a while and felt each other out and and got to know each other and, and uh, agreed to work on the project of this is where I live. And we wanted to not recreate the wheel, but retain some of the essence of some of the stack stuff, but make it a little bit broader, more yep. all inclusive with different genres of music. Um, yeah, you guys did such a good job of that. Like, it's not a, it's not a throwback record at all, but it has elements of it, but elements. it's just new and fresh at the same time. Right. So. Uh, I went to New York uh, two or three times and we had writing sessions and it was comfortable because his studio was uh, in his home in the basement of a nice studio there. And so we could sit and, and write something one day and put it down if we didn't like it. The next day we'd come back and change it. And, and, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, it was a lot like the Stax days, you know, writing oh, cool. right on a time clock. Yep. So, so I, I enjoyed that. So we worked for about a year and a half on just, well, I guess we must have gone through 20 or 30 songs. Whoa. Just to find that right ingredient there that we wanted. Yeah. Of course, uh, he knew my history. Uh, he was telling me that uh, as a teenager, he and his band in school and everything would do a lot of the stack stuff, and he was a fan of my my yeah. stuff. So all of that we knew, and uh, so we just took our time and 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 may ensured that we had good lyrical content, that we had good melodic structure and that we were retaining some of the essence but not dwelling on the essence of my early career. So, uh, of course, uh, we were successful and won a Grammy, and I was just elated over that. Uh, And uh, my first Grammy after all those years. Woo! Yeah. (laughs) Finally. It's about bloody time, man. And... um, (laughs) <laughs> so then, uh, of course, we toured and traveled. Uh, I'm involved with uh, the Take Me to the River project with giving back to the kids and everything yep. and working with kids in Berkeley and the Stax kids. So we did that, and we would tour it for about a year and a half with the Take Me to the River thing and with the new uh, song from the new uh, This Is Where I Live CD. Uh, after that, of course, COVID put a sidetrack on everybody. Yeah. And, and we were sidetracked, and I was home with my band. And uh, I've got a, a, a big uh, 12 piece band. Whoa. Uh, 
that <laughs> like the old, yeah. Jeez, man. And then actually, they we like family. They've been with me, the Total Package Band. They've been with me for 25 years now, with the exception of maybe three of the, we call them youngsters, and they've been with me about five years. Now, are but, these all at, at, at Atlanta-based musicians? All Atlanta-based musicians and just really top-notch stellar musicians in mm-hmm. their own right. Uh, my production partner, Reginald Wizard Jones, and I uh, sat down to write some brand new songs. And I incorporated a couple of guys from my uh, band and and one of the guys that Larry that works with me in the business <laughs> is also a guitarist and songwriter. Oh, cool. So I utilized my people in the studio for about a year. We worked on songs. We record them. And I let my ears cool off. And I'd come back a week later, listen to them. And if I wanted to change something, I did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's lyrics. a nice relaxed pace to work at. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so we took about a year and a half to come up with uh, one day closer to home, which is my new one. Yeah. And, uh, again, uh, Wiz, Wizard and I probably worked on probably thirty songs. Whoa! And did you guys co- did you co-write most of the tunes, or are you the sole all writer? Except, uh, all except one. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, there's some great songs on there, man. Like uh, that, yeah. I still I still go to parties. It's such a killer tune. Uh, yeah, I, I call that my old folk song. Yeah, it's yeah, like, I love it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he has been with me. Wiz has been with me about. We were talking about that the other night about thirty years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he first moved to Atlanta from Pittsburgh, of course, I used him on a session, and he was such a prolific player. So. Uh, Signed him up right away. So, and yeah. he's been with me all those years, and wow. he does go out and 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 work on concerts behind other different acts and music director and stuff. But he'll come back, and we're in the studio and recording. We work on some of my artists that we've got, and yeah. and uh, then um, I wanted to keep the band with some income because, like I said, we're family. Yep. And uh, they hadn't worked in a while with the COVID thing because nobody was working. (laughs) So I said, well, let's just lock into the studio and we'll cut some tracks and we'll do some things. And so I used my entire band on this particular project. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And they came through my backup singers, my band members and everything. And uh, what was the what was the general uh um, mode of working as far as this project goes? Were you tracking things live or was it all pretty separate or how did you do it? No, uh, was it, we did the rhythm first. Uh, mm-hmm. like, And of course, I, then I put my vocals down and everything else is icing on the cake around all of that. Okay. But, uh, but um, we did uh, the rhythm and then... Uh, I let them take a little break for a couple of weeks where I did all my vocal work. And then once I got the vocals that the way I felt comfortable and liked, I would call him a backup singers to put the backup on. And then uh, I sat with Wiz because he's another Jones. He's Reginald Jones, <laughs> no kin to Booker, but mm-hmm. he's uh, one of Cut these. from the same cloth? Yeah, in the same club. <laughs> He, he's one of those musicians that I said I tell him all the time I hate you because I can, <laughs> I can play piano and chord and, and strum a little guitar, but you play five or six different instruments. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know he's he's a wonderful person and been with me all these years. So we sat and just listened to the songs after having the the, the, the tracks and the backup voice and the lead vocal on, and we sat there. 
and just came up with arrangements for each particular song to what we thought it would be. Some we put horns on, some we put different uh, other instruments on, like organ and stuff. But whatever we thought the song needed to enhance it and not overproduce it, uh, that's what we did. And then we had to sit there for probably a month in mixing yep. <laughs> because I'm I'm the worst one about mixing. I hear every little detail. <laughs> do, you get, do you get right in there and get involved? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, he and I are uh, co-producers on it. Yeah. And uh, we would mix something and I'd take it home and put it on different systems, listen to my yep. system at home, listen in the car, listen on a little Mickey Mouse system that I got. You got to do it, man. And if it doesn't feel right or sound right or get the same vibe out of it, let's go back to the drawing board and remix it. And so yep. that's what we did. And I think that we pretty much, we, we were satisfied with that. We've got a, a decent product out of it. And I definitely, because it is world music now and, uh, when you're writing something, you're putting it up on the internet and you're putting it out physically and all that stuff, but it's world music. And I figured I want to have the kind of songs that, and in my travels, uh, I realized that people are people the world over. So if you, you write something and you're honest about your writing and creativity and no matter what country or what (laughs) nationality or whatever it is, they will, you know, be able to identify with it. Of course, so that's yeah. what we did, basically. And and with your vocals, because the vocals are such a big part of it, but I would imagine for you, like you're such a natural singer that you don't have to labor over it too much. But is that something that you, like are you pretty self-critical about how, your actual vocal performance? Do you sit there and like do a million takes of it or is it pretty more live? Or, <laughs> more, really? than, more than anybody. Sometimes we'll get a take and they'll say, that's it, that's it, no. <laughs> I I will I have sat there in the studio by myself with a microphone and a remote for the board and everything yeah. or the or the computer and I have sat there and gone over my vocals on my own uh, because I can't engineer so I'm old school engineer and everybody else I've got uh, Brandon and with it did the uh, digital domain yeah. thing, but we learn from each other. I teach them old school, they teach me the new yeah, one. So, uh, but I have sat there and put down my vocals on stuff, and they are usually coming in, they are amazed. They say, like, How did you come up with that? Well, when you're in the studio and there's nobody but you at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no <laughs> abstractions or distractions yeah. or something. And so I'm just in the studio, locked in by myself, and I'll you do really it. work. You work hard on that stuff. Yeah, and I do it till yeah. I'm fine tune it till I'm satisfied. And do you have a studio in your house, or do, are you working at a commercial facility in Atlanta? No, somewhere? I have a commercial studio in College Park. It's about 15 miles south of my house. Oh, so you own a studio that's like a, a, a yes. business of its own? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Have you had that for a long time? Oh, uh, we've had it for about 20 years. Okay. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy business. <laughs> it, it is. And yeah. uh, I like that because it's like a workshop, you know, I can go in there and and try out things and yeah. I'm not on the clock per se. And then after I, after I listen to it a couple of days, I'll let my ears cool off, go back and listen to it, and, and really realize, is that what I heard? Uh, without fooling myself or whatever. <laughs> but uh, I'll go back and, and, and fine-tune it until I'm satisfied with it. Fantastic. So are you going to be out on on tour this year? Like, are people going to be able to see you with the new record out and all that? Is that going to be happening? We're working on that now. I'm also working with uh, the Take Me to the River project. We're doing uh, the trilogy of it, of our influences on the European musicians. And we oh. started uh, filming on that. So I'm, I'm 
I'm doing a lot of stuff at once, but I do plan to go out maybe later in the summer mm-hmm. and do some touring for a couple of weeks to on this new CD. Because I, I, I love meeting the fans and 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 the industry and and stuff and. I'm still ham enough that I enjoy doing it, so I yeah. want to go out and do it. So I, I plan on doing that. So we're working on getting that all structured together after I finish my uh, work with the Take Me to the River project with the filming. That's a huge ordeal, organizing a tour for a 12-piece band. Oh, <laughs> Man, uh, yeah. I we have a good, uh, my band leader, uh, his wife is also my tour manager. The okay. Tyrone and Jackie, they they they're like my right arm there, and yeah. then and we we do everything in house from the videos to the graphic design. Jeanette does all of the graphic designs for my uh, CDs and 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 yeah. and vinyl, and uh, then Larry, of course, is a utility man. He he promotes marketing and promotion and. A little bit of, and and part songwriting he does a little mm-hmm. bit of everything. so we we're, we're tight knit outfit I've got maybe six people in house but yeah. we all do four or five jobs we're not running over each other you know so yeah so um, but we do we do it all in the in house and we've got a room set up for video and a room set up for the rehearsal and then we got three different suites on that old side of the building. Whoa, that's awesome. So uh, and then we've got the the recording studio and the regular business offices. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, such a fan of your music. And, and uh, I think the, the recent stuff you've done is as good as all the early classic stuff. And I just can't wait to see what you do next. And I hope to um, see you out on tour one of these days. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'll make sure that Larry, you know, let everybody know. Um, but thank you for having me. And and thanks for not only being a fan for, but helping me within the music structure because we don't do it all ourselves. You know, uh, I've learned that years ago. Artists uh, sometimes think they're doing all this by themselves. There are a lot <laughs> of behind behind the scenes people that, that 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 are working night and day making this thing happen. So yeah, man. You too, yeah. Well, thank you. It's great to talk to you, and uh, thanks for all your memories. And uh, we'll see you one of these days. I hope. All right. Have a good one. All right. Take care, William. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, everybody. Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast is produced at the Hen House Studio in East Nashville, Tennessee. Please remember to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can find more info on this episode, including show notes and an audio playlist for Spotify and Apple Music at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thank you again to our sponsors this season, Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra in 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resonator Guitars, and The Hen House Hang. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for another chilling episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. Over and out.